this week, um, I worked on the I build these selectors uh, spec, uh, and so this was work with Jeremy, uh, Stephen, David, and others. Um, selectors are a long-standing thing that we've wanted for many, many years. Uh, there's a lot of conversations gathered over the years as to what we want. Um, we've tried a number of times to come up with some languages and syntaxes that would kind of satisfy a lot of the requirements um, and have so far been unsuccessful. Um, so this spec uh, begins by kind of articulating what, what selectors are um, and links to a bunch of prior work that expands a lot on, on the goals of selectors and so on. Um, describes a few kind of design notes for what we would want out of, out of selectors. Uh, and then it kind of narrows on the problem by saying what this is not about, which usually end up, ends up bike shedding uh, the ability selectors questions. Uh, it, a lot of them get derailed by other things. So really selectors are about how do we succinct, succinctly identify a DAG subset connected to the root. That's it. There's like nothing else involved in, in uh, making a selector. Uh, that's still a pretty hard problem. There's a lot of requirements. Uh, I source these and run them through a few people, run them by a lot of people. Um, and we weren't able to find more yet. There might be other, other selectors, uh, sorry, other requirements for selectors, but these are roughly, uh, roughly what they are. Uh, and what these boil down to is that you can't actually come up with one, um, because we have certain requirements around upgradability of the system in the long term, um, and we want to be able to learn from, from pretty different systems, uh, we end up with the fact that you can't have one single syntax that encapsulates all of those requirements. So contrary to what XPath and CSS selectors did uh, of boiling everything down to a single syntax, um, we instead take a different approach which is more consistent with how we approach other things, which is to say um, we have a, an interface for what a selector is and is supposed to satisfy, and then we have the ability to have different types, and we can have some very basic selectors that we should by default, but for, create a process by which other groups can, other participants and so on, can create new selector types and contribute them to the, uh, to the system. And then over time, if some of those become really popular, then they can become part of, of standard libraries uh, and so on. Uh, and so what this means is that you know, we, we use typing, uh, we have a system of selector types that allows creating new selector languages and syntaxes, and we can compose them, which is an important part of that. Um, we create an easy path for plugging selector types into FPLD libraries and other consumers. Um, and then we need a live process for testing and submitting new selector types. So there's a, this outlines a whole bunch of work ahead uh, for the selector effort, um, which means, hey, we need a well-defined binary and human, human readable um, self-description for types. That's easy, it's just a multicodic. Um, we have a, we need to define a very narrow selector interface for most uses of selectors. Um, so that way, all systems that need to use selectors, things like graph sync or cluster for pinning, uh, or IPFS for pinning, providers for uh, expressing provider records, or um, you know, even things like Bitcoin uh, when they need to synchronize a chain or, some, or things like that, um, would just use that interface. Uh, and so that's a, a very succinct uh, description of what a selector uh, is and does. And then we need um, a standard way to add the selector type implementation to IPLE, IPLE libraries. So in an IPLE library, we export the IPLE selector interface, and we need a way to um, add type implementations to that library. So that just means like a simple way of defining modules such that you can insert new types uh, over time, and so that users of a library can do that as well to experiment with things. Um, then uh, we, we need to make sure that we use pervasively as much as possible the abstract selector type, and we don't like embed some like specific thing all over the place. Um, we came up with a number of simple selectors that cover most of the common cases: um, CIDs, paths, globs. Uh, I'll show you a few, a few more in a moment. Um, we have a selector type that allows composing selectors. So this means some like selector that handles multiple selectors. <laughs> the working title is multi selector. That might change because to avoid confusion with the multi formats world. Um, and then uh, two important aims are that, one, we want to aim for language independent implementations of selectors. So think of writing parsers and execution and so on in a language agnostic way, so that, or in a 
portable way, maybe it's the best, better way to describe it. Uh, and that would be in the long term, uh, things like Wasm. Um, but in the meantime, uh, really be fine allowing language specific implementation of self selectors, which are, is what's going to happen for the simple ones. For CIDs and PATs and maybe globs, like we're just going to write at them, JS and go, and that's much easier than trying to like shoehorn some Wasm thing into either of these systems. Um, and, and that'll cover, so the claim is that uh, CAD and PATH might cover you know, some huge percentage of the times when we want selectors, and then maybe globs would cover like probably up to like 80 or 90% of the use cases that we described. So the other more complex selector stuff is really for future applications. Um, one really important thing here, important, um, is to create a well-designed uh, set of test vectors um, representing a variety of the use cases for, for IPLE selectors. So that means um, coming up with a whole bunch of graphs that describe and then selector expressions over those graphs with like the test cases, right? Of saying this selector applied to this graph should yield this. Um, and if we have a bunch of those that, that cover a bunch of those like really tricky edge cases, once we have those, then we can write different selector implementations or different kinds of selector syntaxes apply to those test vectors and, and, and you know, know that that'll be fine. Um, and or, so some of the types uh, to describe, uh, the null selector selects the empty set. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's a CID which selects a specific CID, so that it's a very simple selector. It just picks a, one, a single node and a path up to it, path to the root. Um, a path which selects an IPLD path within that, so that means like CID and some path down. Um, a glob, which is a Unix style glob, so that's you know using star for you know uh, every name or or fulfilling filling any kind of character in there. Um, star star for representing all, all uh, descendants, like including slashes, um, and some other parts of the syntax. So globs might include actually. I'll just go through them because I wrote them up. Um, question marks matching any single character and so on. Uh, and you'll notice here that that in this. There's kind of like a, a hint at what the binary format might look like and what the string format might look like. Um, important that their selectors need both a binary and a string representation because there'll be a lot of cases where selectors get dumped out to the user and the user needs to be, like systems building on selectors need to just count on the fact that these things have a human readable representation. Um, that's not gonna like, you know, uh, mess with the user. Uh, uh, there's a, yeah, one we'll selector that just is kind of like an S expression that applies uh, unions, intersection, and difference over, over selectors. Um, and then one part of the spec, to, spec is really showing what these interfaces might be in Go. Um, so this is meant as kind of like a general thing, but it became like more, as, as happens with Go, it just really quickly becomes like close to an implementation, which is, you know, your prototype is your implementation. Um, and this kind of goes through what uh, a DAG is and kind of boils down to a simpler interface. Um, th there's kind of a proposed traversal structure for how to go through things. This is kind of a, um, something that relates to a bunch of other things we want to do in IPLD, being able to uh, crawl through DAGs similar to how you, you do os.walk or, or iterate over, over things. Um, and then once we have those things defined, then a selector is pretty simple. It just checks whether a specific path is part of that selector uh, inside of a DAG. And um, that's really like it so far. Uh, it has these other like, kind of convenience things, like we can return the root of the selector, can return the type, can return its, its byte oriented, uh, its, its byte representation and string representation. Um, and there's this notion of whether or not a selector is absolute. So, so the important thing here is, um, turns out selectors have Similar to paths in, in Unix file systems, uh, they could be absolute, meaning they're like rooted as a CID, or they could be relative, which means you apply them on top of any root. So that means you, you might have a selector that you apply, you have a DAG, and so you apply that selector onto that DAG, and you, you let the root of the selector be the root of the DAG, and so then it just becomes relative. And that's similar to you know typing CD or, or cat with like a, yeah, cat is a better example, cat with like a glob in shell, right? So if you do cat with a glob in shell relatively, like that takes your working directory and applies that relative glob <laughs> onto, onto your working directory. If you apply it with like a slash at the beginning, then that's just absolute. That's all that means. Um, but, but making that distinction here ends up being really useful in a bunch of other places. Um, yeah, 
And that's it so far for, for this thing. I think future work here includes defining a bit more of what these pieces of, um, of work might look like. Um, so actually going through and, and so, so instead of like doing it just yet, um, scoping out what some of these things will, will imply and kind of describing requirements for things like the IPLE libraries. The IPLE library for in Go needs to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and so that's uh, gonna come out of this. Mm -hmm. uh, great, so that's uh, any questions so far for IPLE selectors? Uh, how do we plan to support like multiple path types? So basically like IPLE paths are a bit different from like Unix FS paths. Yeah. Great question. That is a hard question. Um, <laughs> that depends on whether or not we, um, it depends on two questions. One question is whether or not we have the magical type system. Uh, if we have the magical type system, then everything is easy. Uh, let's assume that we don't have a magical type system yet. Uh, if we do, uh, then it really becomes a question around, do, can you, what do you need to do in a data structure like UnixFS to give an IPLD layer enough information to understand more complex objects? So for example, a file, it's kind of just like one object, right? Even though it has a bunch of nodes inside of it. Or a sharded directory is one object. So you would want to be able to, to you know, traverse things like uh, this, the path to a directory that happens to be sharded and then write just the name of a directory and then move forward. And then that might actually represent a whole bunch of like traversals inside of a larger graph. Um, so ideally, we would want selectors over, over those higher level, level constructs as well. Uh, they can likely be expressed the exact same way. The syntaxes don't change, the languages don't change. What changes is, is how they execute and how they apply it into the DAGs. Uh, and so what we really need to figure out to be able to make that possible is how this composite object data structure thing, how that behaves as an IPLD node. If, if, if that whole composite object can satisfy some IPLD node interface, then, then, it'll, then, then that can work kind of out of the box. Um, meaning, I don't think that's a selector's problem, that's a, how do you represent those complex data structures as a PLD nodes? Problem. Uh, it, yeah, what? Yeah, I was going to say you have your hand. Oh, uh, that doesn't solve the problem of current units of S with their, their current data structures that aren't, don't expose anything, they just have bytes. Uh, but there are probably ways to fix that with reinterpreting history. Well, they can, they can probably just change in the code, right, of Go and, and JS, so the, the code of Go. UnixFS and JS UnixFS. Do you mean change? Um, representing those direct, those sharded directories and those sharded files as a single IPLD object, that can happen in an IPLD library. Yeah, we'd have to understand, like, the, that, the layer that does this would have to understand this transition. It's That's right, and yeah. so it would have, it would export the sharded, the whole sharded directory or the whole sharded file as a single object for the purposes of the selector stuff. Yeah, which, but something would have to tell it that this is a sharded directory or sharded file. What I'm saying is selectors shouldn't, let's, let's probably have a by clinic here. Um, I'm gonna have a, uh, a board um, mm -hmm. and say that I, I, that is definitely a concern and it, I think it, can, it needs to be addressed at, at the layers of data structure definition. Um, selectors shouldn't, we shouldn't have multiple types of select, or we shouldn't have multiple selector levels like Raw IPLD selectors, and then the comp, you know UnixFS selectors, and like you know whole different families of selectors. That is going to get massively confusing. That would be like having different types of different like path traversal systems depending on which file system you have. Which we have, uh, but so we will have to sit down and talk about this because I think we're like we're sorry, hand waving too much, and saying well yes. this is possible magic, and no, no no I'm saying like let's not leave it to magic. Let's make it very very concrete. Yeah, uh, and let's not assume that. Ideally, selectors have to solve all the problems. So we need sure, to solve these problems. Fine. Okay. We, we need to come up with concrete examples of things I don't or we don't believe will work, and then figure out concrete solutions that will actually show that these work or Great. prove that they don't work. That's it. Good. I have a project question. Um, is there already someone who is devoted to working on implementing selectors in IPLD land? Um, does this fall actually on the Go and JS teams to implement selectors? It sounds like there's changes in UnixFS that would live within our teams. Like, how is this resourced? 
Um, great, yeah, great question. This is required in order to enable graph sync such yep. that if we have graph sync on our OKRs, which we currently do, this is not on anyone's OKRs. Great, great, uh, thank you, Flag. So, um, so far, most of the IPLD components have been implemented by Go and JS team separately. Um, it, it was the hope that in the long term we would kind of like be able to have an IPLD team that would just handle this for both both cases for both Go and JS. We do not have that yet. So, um, if it is a goal to make GraphSync, and as a prerequisite, we need to make selectors, um, then that suggests that dependency is there. Uh, and so that might mean actually GraphSync is not doable until this lands. And so that either gets pushed out uh, or we find somebody to handle this sooner, uh, which I don't know who might be, like who might have the time and, and, uh, and knowledge to dive into this and land it such that GraphSync could be done. Because yeah. I know our, like, our prototype, there's like a P something with a prototype implementation of GraphSync. It seems like this is, we probably need no care on this prototype implementation of selectors first. Yes. On our own case. Yeah. Can we have a discussion tomorrow when we finalize the OKRs? Before we finalize our OKRs. Sounds good. All right. Is, it, is, is there a second? Can we pause? Step? I will pause the recording and then you start the uh, Are there more questions about selectors first? Sweet. Um, before you pause, I think it might just be best to include the graph sync discussion here because it's a lot shorter and it's really dependent on all this. Okay. okay. So having it separately, people will be like, what? And it would just you know, force them to rewatch the, all of this. I was just trying to um, make small. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, so this whole IPLD selector stuff was motivated by uh, trying to pin down what, uh, pin down graph sync. And so the, the like original goal for graph sync is to make a protocol to synchronize graphs across peers and specifically like selectors. So so the, the whole inception of graph sync was to get BitSwap to be like upgraded with <laughs> selector capable stuff and downgraded with like all of the market dynamics, meaning uh, BitSwap originally had two goals. One was moving around just simple blocks of content, and the other was to measure this like ratio stuff. Um, the original goal was to, when we created graphs, the idea of a graph sync was to separate those two out into two protocols. One which was just going to handle the synchronizing of graphs with selectors, and another um, protocol that would handle all the other kind of like measuring uh, dynamics. Um, so specifically, the graph sync protocol was uh, like the, the goal was to make a thing that is like BitSwap, but instead of just moving around one list of of um, hashes, uh, would instead move around one list of selectors. Um, so this um, document begins with like a whole bunch of concepts and, and a glossary because uh, aligning on what all of these things mean is uh, important. Uh, and what these like very precise words and how they're used in relation to graph sync. Um, you know, it's kind of like graph sync specific. Um, so this, uh, right now it's a much earlier piece, but the, the whole like protocol part has been figured out. Um, and so this is taking much of what BitSwap already does and just uh, cleaning up a certain problem around requests and responses that was there previously and adding the selector um, piece. And so this is uh, work that I did with Jeremy. Um, we preserve the idea. So, so I'm gonna assume that people are familiar with BitSwap. Uh, I'm sorry, I do, don't wanna like, this document is not large enough to explain the whole thing in detail. Um, so for now, I'm just gonna define in terms of BitSwap. The goal is for this spec to, yes, actually describe all of this fully so that, so that you don't need to understand BitSwap beforehand. It's just not there yet. Um, so, uh, you might the, we this is this protocol is best described through like the the protobuf message, uh, which is very similar to the BitSwap one. The BitSwap one, BitSwap one had this notion of a want list and then a set of data blocks. Uh, this adds the notion of a response, um, and so you have a list of requests, a list of responses, and then a list of blocks. And so all graph sync messages, this version of graph sync, all graph sync messages would be a list of requests, a list of responses, and a list of data. The requests um, have, instead of a hash, they have a selector. 
Um, they include some space for extra data. So this is because there are protocols that want to hook into the system that might want to introduce additional information. Um, and so this is like a, a reserving a tag for those, those groups. Um, they have a priority similar to how Bitswap works and they have canceled similar to how Bitswap works. Um, they also have added just a, one ID. The, the reason for this ID note is that you need to be able to recognize the response and associate it with, with that request. Um, the reason for the addition of the response is that there are a lot of cases in these this, these um, once you have like a swarm of participants trying to replicate DAGs where something goes wrong or the content is not there or all kinds of things happen where you want to be able to s send a message back to the original requester uh, telling them that either you're working on this, you don't have it, you don't plan to give it to them or to like go away because they're dosing you and like stop. Uh, and so that, this is why this response was added. And so this is moving, moving what used to be kind of bit, a very BitTorrent inspired thing more towards uh, HTTP APIs and RPCs. Um, so it's, it's like a slight move, it's not a very significant move. Um, it's still you know, a single message. It's, you, you don't need to track the notion of kind of requests and keep them open in the same way as HTTP does. Uh, it's still, you, know, you send one message and you receive a message, but you have ways of communicating about those, those requests. Um, and then there's like some some of the, the kinds of pieces responses that you might send. send. Uh, so this uh, I went through this with a few people, um, making sure that it kind of covers what most people uh, wanted. Uh, things around uh, just information, like being able to send additional peers. For example, this is a common request where um, <clears throat> you know that somebody you, you know other participants have the content. So, so requester asks for selector X, the responder receives selector X, and they know that some other party has the content, uh, and they would want to facilitate that distribution without having to resort to some other content routing system like the DHT. This provides a, a simple piece for that to happen right in band. Um, question on that one in particular. Is that, um, can you do these response codes in addition to each other, or are they unique? Because you could also you could be working on it and also give them peers that they could parallelize yeah. against. Great question. Uh, so that um, would be articulated in prose uh, as this document evolves. Uh, that's what this partial and terminal uh, mean. So partial means that I'm sending a response to that request with that information code, but it's not a terminal. So, so I might send so you I as many of these three. as I want mm -hmm. until I send you one of these terminal ones. Once I send you these terminal ones, then I garbage collect all notion of the request, and so should you. Um, so, so this probably like uh, for completeness here, this spec should have a little state machine of how these these work, uh, which Biswap already implies. It's just not documented. Uh, Biswap already has a little bit of a state machine around one list and cancels. It's just not described anywhere, um, and so this spec should have that that state machine. So it's very clear. It's like you know you you send a request, the the requester sends the request. The responder receives a request and can send a set of responses until they send a terminal response, and that's it. Um, uh, we also gathered a set of uh, example use cases of graph sync. So things like syncing a blockchain. Uh, we would like, you know, give me, give me this hash and the parent, or you know, as many so on back, uh, or give me the nodes that exist in some hash but not in hash two. So this is like the selector uh, difference, right? So you you say. I want everything represented by this hash, and but not everything at this other hash. That that really just means from this hash to this other hash. Um, you know things like downloading package dependencies, loading content from deep within a giant data set. Um, so so this kind of like path stuff. Uh, and so all of these, in a sense, are expressing requirements for selectors. This is why selectors are so relevant to graph sync because what what a, a request for graph sync so far had been was being able to express these kinds of requests down at the lowest layer of Bitswap, uh, as opposed to doing this like, you know, kind of um, back and forth. Uh, yeah, so. Any question? I have a question for the yeah. group. This is really cool. Um, does nice this one. relate to the pinning stuff we were talking about for cluster? Um, so what cluster wants is the ability to pin up to a certain depth in a graph or from a certain depth in a graph. It seems like selectors are now a way to describe those sorts of relationships. Um, are these dependency at all? 
Um, selectors originally were intended to be able to be used by pinning, but pinning hasn't, you know, described itself as dependent on selectors. Meaning, had we had a magical selector solution that already worked, then it would make perfect sense to just use it for pinning. Um, we, we do run into an issue though, where when thinking about like how we'd actually use selectors and pinning, if there's no way to compare selectors and say this selector contains this other selector, then we can't take advantage of like remembering information about what's pinned and what's not pinned. And now like when we run GC, we just have to run every single, or sorry, when we either remove or add a selector, we have to run every single selector to see like what the changes are, or when we remove GC, we'd have to do the same thing. We, this, is, this is still uh, related to kind of like how the relative uh, pinning works, right? So right now, I don't think that's optimized right now where you have two, no. two pins, two recursive pins that are actually, con one contains the other. Uh, we don't actually detect that. Well, currently, whenever we run GC, we walk through every single pin in general, which is not going to work with the large data sets. We actually walk through every single thing in the data store. We've been thinking about like some way of memorizing lots of information, so we only have to like do this once when we add and remove things. Yeah. So, so you're describing uh, ideally, you should be able to take a whole bunch of selectors and compress them down to a to a single selector that they duplicates a lot of that information. And then yeah, so it makes it efficient or makes it efficient. Effectively, it means effectively, what we have to do is run a GC without looking at all the data only look at the data you need to remove. Uh, but with selectors, like, it makes it difficult unless you can actually compare them, because like, otherwise, like, what I want to be able to do is I want to say, okay, remove the selector because I'm unpinning the selector. Now, which of my other selectors applies? If I can order them and say, oh, this selector contains this other selector, it's really easy. Then I just basically find the one selector that that's, like, contains all the others, and then I, I pick that one. Otherwise, I have to like, basically run every single selector and say, okay, now which is the new one that applies and keep yeah, this and, data. And I think this is a well understood problem in things like CSS that have, like, massively cascading selectors over huge trees. So I think that there exists uh, some really good implementations for this kind of stuff. For specific subsystems, but yeah. So some, specific, some implementations for this kind of stuff that should give us a lot of the tricks and learnings that we need to yeah. build our own. I have another question for the group. For the people who did the bit swap discussion earlier about the ways that we kind of wanted to re-architect bit swap to um, be more intelligent about kind of how we're, how we're doing this in the uh, various layers of the how does this relate to that at all? This yeah, is safely compatible with that. Great. Well, it's Stephen's proposal, so what could be? Huzzah, good record. Uh, one thing I'll note is uh, in the requirements, there is some <laughs> requirements for lectures that they say they can select with seeded pseudorandomness, and this might seem completely weird and arbitrary. The reason that's there is that it should be possible for one party to send effectively the same selector to several parties, but give them some mod modulos that they have to, so I, I want to be able to request, give me this graph, mod seven, because I'm asking seven people. So just give me every seventh node. And so I asked that to seven different parties, and then they should, in order, give me all different blocks, as opposed to all giving me the same content, right? So right now there's a problem with this software here. It's a way of expressing sharding of the request directly in the selector. This might not solve it, solve all the cases, but it's like a thing that can be used. So there might be other things like that uh, with selectors. Where you, and so maybe not a randomness example, but some other kind of example, like saying, "Give me this part, this like left side of the tree," and you ask another party to give you the, the right side of the tree. This gets easier with bit fields because with bit fields you could actually directly ask, like. <laughs> Um, I want to, you know, this chunk of, of notes from you, this other chunk of notes from the other person, this chunk of notes from the, the third party, um, and you can keep changing these. This is what BitTorrent does. BitTorrent does this very quickly and effectively because everything's around bit fields, and you can modulate which bit fields you send to what party, and, and you can govern, you, you can tell others what, what to send you to avoid sending you a lot of duplicate stuff. I don't see how that relates to pseudorandomness. Oh, um, uh, maybe it's just like not the entirely correct term, or something. But yeah, like maybe, yeah, like, maybe um, if you want to this to be a stack. So yeah, so yeah, you're right. Uh, this isn't uh, perfectly uh, described. What what um, what I mean is basically being able to make a random choice uh, on the content based on the content. Um, so so basically saying like. Take, take it, supposedly there's a one part of the selector that selects a, a sub die. Now I want to you to roll a die, and if that die is like, you know, a one, then give me that. that but one. the die is determined by the content. 
Um, not. You can make it con uh, determined by the content. It, it's not if you make it only determined on that node. So so basically, it's like the diet, the the modulus check is on the hash of each particular node. Then that will be unbalanced. So some parties might send you a lot more stuff than, than others. Is cost be used with like machine learning stuff, or like I, I can send a. Um, a Sorry, request to you that says that basically samples your directory or whatever, or samples your file, and like I see it with some pseudo randomness, so I get a deterministic value from each peer that I'm talking to. Um, but it allows me to run this. Oh, you're saying locally. return to me. So from these massive data sets of millions of points, return to me 100 points. Yeah, return to me 100 random points. Random. Yeah. yeah. So I was just saying, like, if you want to use this for, if you want to use pseudo randomness to like shard requests. You'll end up with probably end up with like duplicate responses and lacking responses. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Not if you send the same randomness to everybody and then they use a different offset. But yeah. Anyway, it's, let's yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Let, let's make sure that whatever ends up in the spec covers the the. Yeah. the, the you, you, you could do a sortation type of, where like you send the number, they use everyone uses it to sort everything, and then you ask for slices of that. But. Right. Any other questions? So yeah, this does not cover the questions around if I have a whole swarm of participants, who do I ask for what? And how do I you know, decrease the uh, duplication or optimize you know, the, the likelihood of me getting content quickly from the parties that I have and so on? That's kind of left at, at a different layer. So the goal of graphs thing was to re like really separate these concerns. So one concern is just the synchronizing of graphs with selectors. The other part is who do you ask? What is likely to be successful and all that kind of stuff.